Let's do a, another brief recap about what we've been doing. Um, so we're talking about learning data, uh, like functions on sequential data. And we want to represent those as uh, weighted automaton, because otherwise we'd be trying to learn something that's infinite dimensional. And I've said this a couple of times, but it's good to remind us that the, there's this very deep connection through the kronecker fleece theorem between um, uh, Hankel matrices and weighted automata, in particular minimal weighted automata. And this has this proof that is kind of very intuitive, where you decompose the Hankel matrix as, a, as a, using this rank factorization, PNS, which in a sense, I mean, you could interpret it as saying that, that you're kind of like measuring the correlation between the past and the future, like uh, in the Hankel matrix. That's, a, that's an intuition that uh, people that use Hankel matrices in other contexts, like uh, control theory, for example, use. And, and using this decomposition or this like uh, correlation interpretation, we said we can derive learning algorithms by just looking at finite blocks of these Hankel matrices using like tools like SBD that will give us like decompositions that are robust to noise. Uh, like we'll be able to recover weighted automata that will also be like slightly robust to noise. <clears throat> so now everything is set up except estimating the Hankel matrix. And I, like I ended the first part by showing like how you estimate this Hankel matrix where you have data sampled from some distribution over, over strings or a dynamical system. And showing that these estimators that I gave you, which typically just involve like counting things over the data. So this, one, this is one of the nice things about this approach, which is like very efficient in terms of like how, what you have to compute with the data is just one pass. It's not like an iterative algorithm where you have to look at the data many, many times. You just look at the data once, bam, you get your Hankel matrix, and then you do something with it. Um, but the missing ingredient um, is basically how we can uh, justify that these Hankel matrices that we're estimating, they're not only consistent when we get infinite data, but we can also say something about the quality of this approximation when we have a finite amount of data, okay? And this goes down to some of the stuff that you've probably seen in Ben and Barun's lecture about concentration inequalities and like sample complexity bounds and stuff like this. So this is no different. In here we have the same type of results, right? So the first observation is that we had this sub-block of the Hankel matrix uh, defined by a set of prefixes and suffixes, like rows and columns. So if we keep this fixed, and the things that we put in there are, say we're in, in the first setting that I described, where the, the things that we put in there are just empirical counts, right? So by concatenating a prefix P and a suffix S in here, you get a string. And in that corresponding entry of the empirical, the estimated Hankel matrix, we can put the number of times that we have observed this particular string in the data, right? This is like an empirical probability, and I showed you that um, entry-wise, right? If you look at the particular entry, uh, the expectation of this is, is the right number, and obviously by, say, law of large numbers, as I get more and more data, I'll converge to that number. Now the question is, what can we say about the matrix as a whole? Because these approximation results that we have, for example, the one that tells you like, well, if there's a small difference in the Hankel matrices, you get small differences in the automaton, that requires a bound that is about like the whole of the matrix, not only entry by entry. So, well, the first thing that, that one can show, a kind of like, and this is like in, at an intuitive level uh, so far, is that if you get a sample size that grows to infinity, then this difference between what you're trying to estimate, this ideal Hankel matrix about the distribution where you're getting your data from, and this empirical Hankel matrix that you've estimated with the sample S that contains MII, these strings, this is going to go to zero as the sample grows, and the typical rate uh, is like 1 over square root M. Okay? Um, now, there's some hidden constants in this O, in this type of results, that are obviously going to depend on the dimension of these matrices and also sometimes on some combinatorial properties of the strings that you can find in here because that is kind of going to control how many repetitions you have. Remember that the Hankel matrix is redundant, so you can find a string in there many times. So if a string is in there many times, 
um, well, I like every time you see that string, you're, you're, you're taking that information and putting it in several entries of the matrix. So that's kind of like makes like the, the estimation of this matrix is a bit special because the entries are correlated. And it's not always easy to see how you can like use this correlation to like get these bounds in, in a tight way. The second one is that this norm that I put here, it can be many different norms. So usually the easy way to prove this sort of results is to use either an operator or a Frobenius norm. Uh, so this is an induced uh, norm, and this is just the, so, the sum of the squares of all the entries, and then you take the square root. And the, second, uh, the third thing that I want to remark about this type of bounds are that actually here I'm just putting this one where you count strings, but if you do the same thing with uh, prefixes or with substrings or with a single trajectory, you can always prove bounds like this. The problem is that each of these settings requires a different proof, and proofs of concentrations of, on, on matrices are kind of, I don't know, like exponentially harder to, to, to get right than proofs on just like scalar quantities. So there's, there's like one result for each of these settings, and all the results have different proofs. You can find uh, the ones for strings, prefixes, and substrings in this paper by Denis and collaborators, very nice paper. And the, the single trajectory thing is something we did last year with a, a colleague in, in Lille. Um, but what I want to give now is one of these bounds, so it's not the tightest one, it's not the best one, but at least give you an idea of how you prove this kind of stuff. And, and, and again, I'm aiming for the stuff that fits in one slide. So, so I'm going like, to prove something that's relatively simple and use this something that you might have seen. Uh, have you seen McDear means inequality before? Yes. OK, a single yes. <laughs> no. OK, so somebody has seen McDear means inequality. Uh, some people haven't. So, so let's remind um, what, what this is. So it's, it's a concentration inequality. Like, for example, you have like Chernov or Hovding bound, stuff like this. But it is a bit more interesting because typically when you have like Chernov or Hovding, you're, the thing that you're doing, so you have like several IID random variables and you're building something that is a sum over them, right? It's always like about averaging. And, and sometimes you have like things that take MIID random variables and what you get is not a sum, it's something different. So you have a more complicated function of these random variables. And this requires you using like other types of uh, inequalities beyond Chernov and Hofding. And McDear means is probably like the simplest one that is kind of very general. Because what it says is, if I have a function phi <coughs> that takes m elements from some domain omega, right? And spits out a real number. And, and this function is, is such that changing a coordinate cannot change the output of the function too much in the following sense. So if I pick any coordinate i, and then I look at like uh, uh, any setting for the m coordinates here, x1 up to xm, and I also pick something, uh, I replace the xi with some xi prime, right? I do like for all i's and for all settings of this, if comparing phi on x1 up to xm versus x1 up to xm with xi replaced by xi prime, if this thing is bounded by C, right? So if, if this uh, function has uh, bounded differences when you change uh, one point in the input, then you can expect concentration in the following sense. So now, suppose that I'm evaluating this phi on a random variable that is x, uh, that is uh, x1 up to xm, which are IID copies from any distribution on omega. And actually, I think you can even uh, give up on the identically distributed. You can just need independence. Um, so then you have the following concentration bound, which is this type of inequalities that say, well, the probability that this random object, right, the function phi evaluated on the random variable x, goes very far from its expectation, Right, so like what the concentration phenomena are like, things are going to concentrate around these expectations, and that's useful for us because we know that these Hankel matrices that we're trying to estimate, the expectation depends on the automaton, 
So if we can show that it, it like what we get from the data is close to what uh, it, to its expectation, then we will be in good shape. We will be able to apply all these constant, uh, like all these perturbation results. So that's one statement of this of this type. Uh, the probability that phi of x is bigger than its expectation plus t is bounded by something that decreases like uh, exponentially, like t squared. Uh, there's an M here, so the more samples you get, the less concentration you get. That is kind of anti-intuitive anti at first. But there's this C squared here that compensates, because usually C squared is going to be something like 1 over M, so you will get an M in, in there. And, and things will be more concentrated as you get more data. So usually instead of writing this type of bounds like this, you, route, you write them like that. So basically you say, well, I'm going to make this, exp this uh, probability very small, say delta, and I'm going to solve for t, and I'm going to say, I'm going to like give the reverse. I'm going to say that with probability at least 1 minus delta, this random quantity has to be less than its expectation plus something that depends on this delta and this like how the things can change when I change one point and the number of data points that I have. So this is kind of like, as I said, a very simple concentration inequality, and we can apply it to prove one of these bounds that is going to tell us, like, well, like, given m strings from some distribution over strings, how close the Hankel matrix that we're getting is to its expectation. Uh, so here's how you do it. And this is where the thing that I said that makes this different from, for example, uh, Chernoff or Hovding, uh, appears here because we have this empirical Hankel matrix that we compute from some sample h hat s and well this I can actually write as an average but instead of trying to show that this concentrates around that which is ideally what you want to do but but is very very difficult to do in the matrix uh, in the matrix setup and and the bounds that I pointed to you before basically like they're like entire papers devoted to that, so it's, 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 it's highly non-trivial. Instead, what you can do is say, well, the function I'm interested in now is in, this, in the norm of the difference, right? In, in the Frobenius norm, and probably, I mean, I've said this a couple of times, but I probably at this point should write what the Frobenius norm is. So if you have a matrix, its Frobenius norm uh, is the square root of the sum of the entries squared. Okay, it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's an L2 norm if you think of the matrix, the matrix is a vector. Okay, so we define this phi and we're going to show that this phi concentrates around its expectation and we're going to show uh, that the expectation of this thing is, 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 is going is, is gonna to do the right thing. Um, so how do we do this? Well, as I said, we can write this guy as a sum, as an average of things. So you can write this HS as an average of Hankel matrices. They're just going to have entries in 0, 1. And each of them is going to index by one string in my sample. So for a string X, uh, uh, H hat X on P and S is just uh, an indicator of, of whether P and S gives you a string X or not. So I'm writing this empirical Hankel matrix as an average of Hankel matrices that are just zero ones and that have ones in the strings that I observed in my sample. That's just a, a simple way to write this. And then I have to introduce a new quantity, which is going to depend on what are exactly the rows and columns that I'm, I'm taking in this matrix, right? So remember that this is a finite block of a Hankel matrix. Uh, it's going to be indexed by a set of prefixes and a set of suffixes. And then I define this, this kind of like constant, CPS, that is the maximum time uh, over all possible strings that uh, things occur in, in, in my set PNS. So basically what this tells me is like, well, if you look at these matrices, like uh, these are again over PNS, so how many, uh, what is the maximum number of ones that these zero one matrices can have? And you can actually also rewrite this as the maximum of the Frobenius norm squares of these things. It's, it's easy to see. So using that, now I want to apply McDiarmid. And McDiarmid tells me you need to show that your function has bounded differences when you change one sample. In this case, the samples are the strings. 
So I write S for this sample x1 up to xm, and S prime for a sample where I change one of the strings, the xith. And then uh, basically I need to compare this with that thing with S replaced by x prime. And you can show by triangle inequality that this is just the difference between these two empirical matrices. And using this thing that there are averages over all the strings in the sample, I only change one of the strings. So this is just like 1 over m, the difference between the Hankels that I changed. So now I just need to compare xi with xi prime. Now these two strings in principle could be arbitrary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to like apply triangle in again and say that this is, well, the, the sum of this Frobenius norm plus this Frobenius norm or two times the maximum of these two guys. And remember that I said that the maximum of these Frobenius norms over all possible strings squared is this coefficient. So I get a square root CPS there. So that's the bound that I get for my C. The C here in McDiarmid is going to be for this phi that I'm using right now, 2 square root CPS M. And I think you, you can even get the 2 to be square root 2, but I didn't fit in the slides. I mean, the argument, not the square root. Um, okay, so that's the first ingredient, like bounding the differences, right? So all I, all I used is like, well, like a triangle inequality. Um, and the second thing is uh, I'm, I'm going to show that then this error, this phi of s, concentrates around its expectation. So now I need to bound the expectation, right? Uh, because I want to show that this is small, I would like to have an expectation that goes to zero. So what you need to do is compute this thing. And here, again, you just have to apply something very simple. You apply Jensen's inequality that tells you that if I put a square here, right, instead of the expectation, I look at the expectation squared. Well, I can upper bound this by putting the uh, squared inside, which by the definition of the Frobenius matrix gets, gets rid of this square root. So I just have a sum of stuff, right? It's like the sum of uh, expectations over like uh, the squared errors on all the entries, which is really because the expectation of this guy is this guy is just a variance. And this is a variance of what? Of whether I'm getting or not that string in the sample. So this is a Bernoulli distribution. So this is the variance of a Bernoulli with, with, that, with the probability HPS, which is the probability of observing that string in the sample. And then this times this, when you sum it over L, it gives you like the, the Frobenius norm of the matrix. And if you sum these overall PSs, you can show that this is upper bounded by CPS. So you get this bound and then you just, well, you can just forget about this. And you get that this uh, expectation is going to be bounded by the square root of CPS M. All right, so you put all this together in McDiarmid by saying, my function with high probability, and the function is this error that I'm trying to control, is upper bounded by its expectation, which I have upper bounded by this, so something that goes down with m, remember this is a constant, plus uh, this kind of like, uh, this thing that depends on c and m, and here I get this, this, this thing that was happening before, so remember that before I had, so McDiarmid has, um, c times the square root m. So now because my c has an m here, uh, the square root m here cancels and I get a square root here, m here, so I get something that goes down to zero with m at the rate that I told you at the beginning, right? So this is like the only proof of this type of concentration for, for Hankel matrices that fits in one slide. But it's already, it's already quite nice because think for example, um, so, so think about this CPS, right? So one thing that you could do instead of doing this argument is do something which is much more naive that says, well, I'm going to apply Chernoff because these things are just Bernoulli random variables. So I can apply Chernoff to each coordinate and then do a union bound. What's going to happen there is that you're going to pay something that's going to depend on the dimension, uh, essentially, unless you can kind of control the correlations between the different uh, entries, which is kind of tricky. In here, you're paying something that is much smaller than, than, than the dimension in a sense, because you're just paying for like how many times something appears in there. So you can pick, for example, like very large P and S's. Uh, no, for example, if I pick P to be all the strings up to length T, the dimensions of my matrix would be exponential, would be the size of the alphabet times T, uh, to the power T, sorry. 
Um, so I, I, when I, 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 was, I would be doing a union bound, I would be paying like something here that, that is much worse than this. Just roughly. Okay, so, so here's like the complete result. Uh, and by the complete result, I mean, if you combine the algorithm that I gave you to go from Hankel matrix to automaton, that is robust to noise, you say, now I'm gonna apply the concentration bound for Hankel matrices. Then I'm gonna use the error bound that I get there, and I'll plug it into that result that says, if you're recovering your automaton with SBD, a small changes in your Hankel matrix translate into these, these changes in the weights of your automaton. And then you further apply the result that tells you, if you change the weights in your automaton, that's how much your language changes. You put all this together and you get a pack learning result for stochastic weighted automata. And I, I know that, that is a lot of things to chain in, and, but, but I'm, I'm just like summarizing this in one slide. So what is the setup again? We have a distribution F on strings that has rank N, right? So that means that it can be computed by some stochastic weighted automata. And you give me uh, M samples, X1 up to XM, IID from this distribution. And you also peak, right, and this is kind of an assumption of what we give the algorithm. The algorithm knows N and knows a set of prefixes P and S such that this condition that I had before, that the rank of the subblock equals the rank of the infinite Hankel matrix is satisfied. Right, and this, I mean, theoretically, uh, they might, it, like this is slightly unsatisfying, but the good thing is that there are many, many, many P's and S's that satisfy this uh, assumption. So in, in practice, that, that is not really a burden, and for theoretical purposes, if you said, well, I wanna get rid of these and actually try to like, infer those from data, uh, I think that you would end up having something that, that's kind of a, very hard to solve. Um, I don't want to say like a particular complexity, but I think it, it would be really hard. But anyway, if you assume that these are given to your algorithm, then the algorithm is pretty straightforward. You just take like these Hankel matrices, uh, H and H sigma for all the sigmas. You put in there the empirical probabilities and there, here you could substitute like prefixes or substrings or uh, anything that I told you before. You apply this spectral algorithm, in the, which is the one that like here it takes the rank n uh, approximation given by SBD and then applies this P pseudo inverse times H hat sigma times uh, S pseudo inverse to get an automaton. And then you get, well, first you get this error bound by combining all this stuff that I told you and, and something that I hinted to but I didn't show you, which is this telescoping bound when you sum over like many strings. So basically what you can show is that with high probability over this sample that I'm getting, right, uh, the error when I look at the probabilities on all strings of length up to L of the original distribution versus what the automaton computes, well, this thing is a big O of this uh, ratio of parameters. So the first thing to observe is that you have a square root M here. So the more data you get, the faster you go down. And I think that like the, the, there's no way to escape this like one over square root M rate. And then you have other stuff. So the more, the further into the distribution that you look, the more you pay in the error. That's not surprising um, because really what, what what you're doing here, in a sense, is saying, well, uh, and it's, it's, it's not a union bound, it's something more clever, but, but you have to pay like, for requiring things that are, uh, give you like, guarantees for like, longer strings. You pay, well, the more symbols you have, the harder it is to like, uh, learn this thing. You have to learn more matrices, so more symbols means you get more error. Um, more states means you get more error, so like, it's, it's harder to learn more states than less states, obviously. And then you have here something that's uh, uh, like a, a bit tricky, which is the smallest singular value of the Hankel block um, that you're looking at. So you have to think about this in the following sense. So if I am trying to approximate this Hankel matrix from data, right, and then I'm going to apply an SBD on it, what I said is 
the matrix that you're trying to estimate has rank n, but when you add noise to it, the, the, you lose this property. The, the matrix can have like arbitrary rank. As you get more and more data, uh, the matrix approaches what you're supposed to be getting. That means that it approaches a rank n matrix. Now, at some point, what's going to happen is that, well, I mean, for this algorithm to succeed, what you need is that you're actually recovering up to some good accuracy the top n singular vectors, because these are the ones that kind of give you the right, uh, say, linear space where your initial weights and transition weights are going to live. So if you don't recover that linear subspace accurately enough, your learning is going to fail. And basically, this singular value here, this nth singular value of the Hankel matrix that, that you're estimating, is controlling for this thing. So this big O is a big O not in, in the sense of like, well, there's a missing constant here, but it's also a big O in the sense of like, unless M gets big enough, this doesn't kick in. And the place where this kicks in is when uh, when, when like M is big enough to kind of like make sure that you're estimating the top N single vectors correctly. Okay, that's more or less the intuition of, of, go, of what is behind the result that I told you that if you change the Hankel matrix, you get a, a small change in the automaton. You, you have to account for this thing. And there, I, I, I hit the constant, but here I'm, I'm giving it to you. The other important remark about this algorithm is that it's quite nice in terms of its running time. Its running time is polynomial. Polynomial in what? Polynomial first is kind of, okay, it's linear in the time, in the size of the sample times the number of strings that you have in there. And this term is going to change if you move from uh, strings to substrings or, 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 or prefixes and so on. But it tends to stay like linear in the sample. So that's very nice because that means, as I said before, you just do one pass on your data, you estimate this matrix, and you can forget about the data. And this, for example, is very, very easy to parallelize. So if you have access to a cluster, you can parallelize this if you have like lots of data. So it's very nice. The second part of the algorithm is this part here. This part doesn't look at the data. This part does an SVD decomposition and some pseudo inverses and some matrix uh, multiplications or matrix vector multiplications. So again, this is polynomial and its complexity basically depends on the size of the alphabet times the number of prefixes times the number of suffixes times n. And the, this dominating complexity, which is kind of like a cubic term in the dimensions of the matrix or like, uh, like quadratic in the dimensions and, 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 and then the rank, this is, is dominated by the SVD. So, so as, for example, if you want to speed this up, again, what you can use is try to use like scalable algorithms for singular value decomposition, of which there are many and some even parallelize. So this is the nice thing about this thing. It is like, well, polynomial random, uh, poly, polynomial running time. You have like sample bounds on, on the accuracy. Um, and so for example, you can compute like, for example, what M you need to get a certain error epsilon here if you want. In practice, in practice works very well. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some, some plots at the very end if, if we have time. Um, but actually, if you like care about accuracy to the like the last say I don't know the last drop of accuracy from your sample, uh, sometimes what you have to do is just take the output here and then refine it with some other algorithms that are more good at doing like fine grain tuning, like gradient descent methods and so on. But but this is is, is quite good and theoretically is very satisfactory. Yeah. With high probability means that there's a log one over delta here that I've hidden, and that this bound holds with probability at least one minus delta. Yeah. So you, you can control that. So like tuning your probability also changes your error. OK, so moving on. What has happened so far is that I've been assuming all the time that my data was generated by some automaton. Now, you might say, yeah, um, I don't know, uh, in some applications like the, the network, uh, network protocols applications or stuff like this, that, like data that comes from computers, this is pretty reasonable. But obviously, when you move to other types of data, like, uh, well, natural language or bioinformatics data, robotics data, uh, this is like a kind of like, uh, I don't know, uh, 
I mean, it's a convenient assumption to do theory, but it's obviously like, like not satisfied in, in lots of applications. So the question is uh, whether we can extend these sort of ideas to this more general setup of statistical learning, where we just assume that we have samples from nature, if you want, which is modeled by a probability distribution that gives us IID samples, and we can do uh, similar stuff in the sense of learning weighted automata from this data using the same time of techniques of like estimating a Hankel matrix and then applying this uh, reconstruction using a factorization of the Hankel matrix and still, and still keep some theoretical guarantees. And we can do that to some extent. What's going to happen is that the guarantees that we're going to get are going to be weaker. Uh, because otherwise, if you try to like get like very like good guarantees or strong guarantees, you again run into the sort of problems that you, you're trying to solve, like NP-hard or even worse problems. In the same way that I kind of pointed when we began in here by saying that one way to escape the negative results by Kearns and Balian um, is to say assume that the object that is like generating my data is the same as the one that is uh, the one that I'm trying to learn, right? as opposed to the general pack setting where you have an arbitrary distribution and something uh, that labels the data. Okay, so this is uh, the motivation for, for looking at learning automata in the statistical learning framework, right? So instead of focusing on the realizable case, we, we don't want to assume now that the data is generated from a nice model, and this is what uh, statistical learning theory sometimes does, and also like it is the, is the framework of agnostic pack learning, but this is like this realm where like, Almost everything you want to do is MP hard, so let's not go there. Okay, so what's the setup now? The setup has changed slightly, and it's also like slightly more general than what we have been doing so far. So now what I'm going to assume is that again I have a sample, xi, yi, that contains MIID examples. And now note that I'm not only getting strings, so xi's are going to be strings, but they each of them is going to come with a real label, yi, right? So I have a distribution, joint distribution over sigma star times r, and I'm assuming I'm getting like uh, MIID examples from this distribution. And what I'm going to try to learn is the function that maps a string to the corresponding real based on this data, right? Note that I'm not even assuming that there's an underlying like function from strings to real numbers here. Well, conditioned on a string, you could take the expectation over the label and you could think that that's what you're trying to learn, which is the, the base optimal uh, predictor. But in general, like in this sample, I could have like the same string many times with different labels, right? So this is like getting close to like real data, like messy stuff, like, no, like uh, you're doing sentiment analysis and you give this to, for people to label and they like go over the tweets and they say, oh, this tweet is positive and this tweet is negative. And then like you get the same tweet with somebody says, this is positive or this is negative. And this is like, like real data, like messy stuff. So then, okay, so how are we gonna learn? What we're gonna do is, I guess you've seen this in, in Baron's lecture, so I'll just like uh, recap it uh, briefly you assume a hypothesis class. That is a class of functions that go from strings to real numbers. And you also assume a loss function. A loss function that we will use to compare a true label or a label coming from the sample with a label predicted by a hypothesis and will give us like a, a loss. So typically, if the prediction is good, the loss will be zero. If the prediction is bad, the loss will be a positive number. And for like, uh, I mean, for most of the statistical stuff, you don't require this thing to be convex, but for the algorithmic stuff, you typically require like this loss to be convex. So I might be assuming convex losses all, all the way, uh, just for simplicity. So now we have the ingredients, we have data coming from a distribution, we have a hypothesis, we have a loss function. What's our problem? Our problem is to find an F hat, that is a hypothesis in this hypothesis class H, as a function that assigns uh, real numbers to strings, that ideally approximates this minimum, right? And the minimum is, I look at all possible hypotheses, and for each of them, I compute, I compute this quantity, which is expected risk, or expected loss, or expected error, right? What, what is it? It's like, I draw a new fresh example, which is a string and a label from this distribution D, 
and I compute the error of predicting this label y that comes from distribution using the hypothesis f in my class. And I look at this in expectation over this new example, and I want to find an f that minimizes this, and I'm going to call this this f star. Now, this might be complicated, and might be complicated for several reasons. Two of them are that first, I don't know how to represent this quantity, so there's no way I can put this thing into an algorithm to get minimized. And the second is that depending on who h if is, even if I had this, uh, it's, it's probably, like, it could be that this optimization is, is, not, uh, is not easy to solve. Like, it, it, it's MP-hard or worse because this is, like, non-convex, say, for example. So, so the way that you, you go around this, and again, I think Baron might, might have told you that, is that usually you do empirical risk minimization, which is motivated as follows. So if I have a large sample S and I have a fixed uh, hypothesis, well, then this thing that I'm interested in minimizing, right, is an expectation. So I could kind of approximate it by this average over my sample, right? So instead of saying I'm going to get like new uh, expectation over x's and y's, well, I have a bunch of iid x's and y's, so why not like compute an empirical ex uh, expectation here? And usually like we call this guy like the expected loss or the expected risk, uh, so L that depends on D, uh, that's the distribution, the hypothesis that I picked, and the loss function. And this uh, kind of approximation is the empirical loss or the empirical risk, and it's an L-hat, it depends on the sample, so that's uh, if the sample, is a the sample is a random variable, so that's really a random variable. And you have, uh, well, again, it depends on the function that I picked and the loss. And the classical approach to statistical learning is to do empirical risk minimization, which basically tells me if you want to minimize that thing, but you don't have access to it, well, just you might as well minimize this thing if you have a big sample, right? So you pick the empirical loss, stack it into this minimization, and try to do this again. Now, here is where you run into these problems that I was hinting at before, which is we for like string to real uh, problems, right? These this problems where I, I, this hypothesis contains functions from strings to reals. Uh, I want to choose a hypothesis class where this will be, uh, this can be solved efficiently, and that's uh, quite non-trivial. But in addition, what we want to guarantee, and that's like the like all like what statistical learning is about, is that we will not be overfitting the data. We will get generalization, and the risk of of, of overfitting the data comes because well, I'm, I'm using, I'm minimizing this over the data. So, well, what happens is that for a fixed f, this approach is this. But now, if I am picking an f that depends on the data, this might not, might not longer be true for the, if I plug f hat here, because f hat depends on the data, and this approximation claim uh, is for a fixed f, right? Th th that is slightly subtle, but it's exactly what, what happens when you analyze this empirical risk minimization problem. So we have to make sure that we pick an H that will prevent overfitting, or that will give us generalization. Um, so how do we do this? Did you see uh, Rademacher complexity in Barun's talk? Okay, cool, that's very nice. So, yeah, so the way to prevent this, this overfitting uh, means that you want a generalization bound, and, and you've, you've seen this in Baron's lecture. What I want to show is that for any f, simultaneously, uniformly, right, and, and, and that's what's going to give us, uh, it's going to get around this problem of, like, choosing the f depending on the data might break uh, this approximation between the, um, like, uh, true loss and the empirical loss. So for all f's with high probability over a sample, I want this loss, the, no, the, the expectation of the error over the distribution, to be close to the empirical expectation plus some complexity term. And this complexity term will depend on the sample, on the hypothesis class, and on the loss. And ideally, it should get smaller as I get more data. And it should also get smaller as my class H gets simpler. So that uh, by minimizing this thing, I get something that also minimizes this thing, right? Because I'm minimizing an upper bound plus some, some complexity term that is independent on f. So one way to control this thing is the Rademacher complexity of, of your class. 
And yeah, Barun told you about this. Uh, this is just like, uh, like the specialization of that concept when I'm looking at hypothesis classes from strings to real numbers. But it's, it's the same thing, right? So the Radamacher complexity uh, at uh, sample size m of the hypothesis class is these expectations of a supremums, right? So what, what do I have inside the expectation? Well, somebody gives me like an f and a sample and I look at all the labels that this f predicts on the sample and then I try to like compute the inner product with these sigma i's which are, which are plus and minus ones, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at how correlated the predictions of f are with this sigma and I, I try to find the f that correlates the most with this sigma on average. And then what I'm doing is I'm averaging over these sigmas we, where they are like independent and uniform, so they're like random noise. So this thing is saying, well, how much can you correlate with random noise in expectation? So if your Fs can correlate with random noise in expectation very much, that means that they have a lot of power to overfit. So you, you like your generalization will be like you'll have bad generalization power, which will translate in a large uh, Radamacher complexity. And then uh, sometimes you you don't have this thing, and the Radamacher complexity depends on the sample. Or sometimes you have the expectation over the sample, and the Radamacher complexity depends just on the sample size. So I don't know which one Barun used, or maybe he used both. Uh, for my purposes, I'm just going to stick to the expectation uh, over the sample. Okay, so if you know how much uh, your, your sample of strings, uh, when you pick like the, the worst f in your class, can correlate with random noise, you can control this quantity here. And I'm not going to do the proof of this. Uh, there's many, many proofs. There's uh, like different uh, ways to show this type of stuff. But basically, I'm going to I'm going to recap this result that says that if your loss is 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 bounded on Lipschitz, which is a, I mean, this is a pretty strong assumption. You can relax it sometimes, but it, it makes for like the more succinct version of the bounds. Um, so then, with high probability over the sample, you have this type of generalization bounds that I was uh, hinting at with a complexity term that is like the Radamacher complexity plus, some, plus something that's 1 over square root m, right? So basically, uh, all, all you have to do now to show that you can find classes of functions from strings to real numbers that prevent overfitting is find classes that are going to have a small Radamacher complexity, meaning Radamacher complexity that goes to 0 as m goes to infinity, typically at the rate of 1 over m or 1 over square root m. And not surprisingly, these classes, uh, we can character, like we can give several examples of these classes in terms of weighted automata or um, all the other stuff. So here's the first of these results. By the way, any questions so far? I, I think I've been just recapping stuff that you've seen in previous lectures, so um, should be following, I guess, I hope. Okay. So now, how do we define these classes of weighted automata that are going to give us good generalization? Um, or like automata or languages? Well, the first thing or the most naive thing we can do is, well, look at the weights. If the weights are not very big, when I multiply these matrices, the numbers of my f cannot grow very big. So in a sense, uh, no, like, like my power of like overfitting, which overfitting typically means that, wow, I predict like exactly this number here that was probably an outlier, and then I predict exactly that number there that was maybe also an outlier, and then I have to come back and like go back to, to normal for predicting the rest of the data. So you can try to prevent this thing by saying, well, the weights of your weighted automaton are going to be relatively small. And again, here comes uh, our, like, uh, this PQ norm that I defined at the beginning. So that's kind of a, no, kind of nicely closes the circle. This thing appears here again. And, and you can do the following. So you can look at weighted automata with n states. So you can look at a subset of those, a n, the, where this norm satisfies a bound r, right? You just put a norm on the weights depending on, on this, uh, a bound on the weights depending on this norm, on all weighted automata with n, uh, or maybe like at most n states. So using this class as your h, right, this gives you, this gives you a class of functions from, from strings to real numbers. One of the problems of this class is that 
is that it depends on the representation. And because you can have different representations, it's, it's not obvious like which functions are in there and which not, right? But anyway, if you assume that this is your, your class of functions, then you can prove this stuff. And, and you, we have a general theorem for like R, but it's easier to state for R bigger than one because there's some like power things that disappear. And basically you can show that the Rademacher complexity uh, when you have a sample of length m on this weighted automata with n states that have weights bounded by r with respect to this norm is of this form. So you have a term L of m, which is the expectation of the, of the length of the maximal string in a sample of length m. So basically, if you're trying to learn with distributions that generate uh, very long strings, you, your Rademacher complexity will be worse than if you're trying to learn from distributions that have like short strings. So that's kind of the, of the intuition because, well, for longer strings, you have more strings, so you have more risk of overfitting in a sense. So you have this first term that depends on like the length of the strings in one over M, and then something that depends essentially N squared times sigma is the number of uh, coefficients in in, in your automaton, right, is the number of coefficients to express the transitions. Uh, and then you have this log m over m, and here you would get like something that depends on r uh, in, in a rather ugly way if your r was not bounded by one. But, but for example, remember that if I put p, so, but this holds for any p and q, right? So for example, if I'm talking about like probabilistic automata, if I have uh, p equals one and q infinity, this guy is bounded by one. So like this already applies to like uh, weighted auto uh, probabilistic automata and stuff like this. Okay, but this has this problem that I said that, well, there's some ambiguity, right? Because for a function, I can have different representations. Some might fall in here, some might not. So like, like there's some ambiguity going on here and, and you might want to do uh, like, to have another way that is more canonical to control the complexity or rather Macher complexity of your class of functions. So, well, another thing that you can do is you can say, well, let, let me look at this object, this function, as essentially this vector or this like high, like infinite dimensional vector that I had before and put a norm directly on the language, right? So I compute the P norm of F as well, the sum over all strings of the absolute value power p of f of x, and then I take like one over p uh, root, uh, pth root. So that defines a norm on the language. Now, I've abstracted this from the automaton. Now, this doesn't depend on, on, on the automaton, so that's nice. I, I get this, this nice uh, behavior. And then, again, I can define, well, a class rp, which are all the functions that uh, have like p norm bounded by r. So again, this in a sense should say, well, I'm not allowing uh, functions that are too complex. I'm not allowing functions that are going to give you like huge values because, well, because th this p norm has to be bounded. So again, you can use this class to, con uh, you can control the Rademacher complexity of this class. And uh, what do you get here? So here I give you the result for like general R because it's simple. So if you're looking at P2, Right, that would be kind of a, an, an Euclidean norm in, in, for these like infinite dimensional vectors. Then your Rademacher complexity is theta, so in here we have an upper and a lower bound, uh, basically r over square root m. So you have something that is kind of very intuitive, right? Allowing for larger languages uh, hurts your generalization. You have more power of overfitting. Uh, getting more data like improves your generalization, uh, brings your Rademacher complexity down. You can do the same thing, uh, so, so we have a general result, but I'm just giving you examples of what happens if you put p equal one and two because they're kind of intuitive. So if you put p equal one, you get something similar, um, but now instead of the square root m, you get an m, so this thing will potentially go to zero much faster with the size of the, of the sample, but you get some other, uh, well, some other number here, this cm, which again depends on, well, on the distribution or on the sample. So now this, ta this time cm is the expectation of, well, the square root of the maximal number of times that you expect to see uh, a string in your sample. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's, it's nice because you, know, you, you get things in there that actually depend on the distribution, so tell you like which distributions are gonna be easier to learn from or which distributions is gonna be harder to learn from. Okay, so 
I've given you two ways to control the Radamacher complexity of hypothesis class on weighted automata. You look at the weights of the automaton or you look at the norm of the language. Um, both have advantages and disadvantages, um, but both have a common problem. And the common problem is that if you if, that you cannot get algorithms with provable well guarantees that will work directly on those representations. The reason is that if you try to optimize uh, directly on the, um, on the language, well, you have to deal with this infinite dimensional object or have a way of every time you get an automaton, compute these norms. And some of these norms, I mean, the L2, you can compute it if I give you the automaton, but the L1, you cannot. So it's not easy to get like uh, good learning algorithms from that in general. Uh, the other thing is if you're trying to like control the complexity by the weight of your automaton, then the natural thing to do is to optimize on the weights directly and you get something that is a non-convex optimization and I'll go back to that later. So, well, what's the solution? The solution, I mean, Hankel matrices, right? Um, so we want a way to control the complexity of the class in terms of properties of the Hankel matrix. And that's, that's the one that is not so straightforward. But here, the right way to control this complexity is in terms of the Shatton norm. So here's an aside for anyone who hasn't seen Shatton norms. Uh, I'm not going to run, run the poll anymore, but I'm assuming that everyone who's, who had seen like pseudo inverses and SVDs might have seen Shatton norms and, and, and the other way around. So the Shatton norm is basically a norm of a matrix that depends on its singular values. And, and here's how it is defined. So if I have a matrix M of rank K and I have K singular values as one up to SK arranged in a vector, if you pick a P between one and infinity, then you have the Shatton P norm of the matrix, M S P, is exactly the P norm of this vector of singular values, right? Um, so, I mean, this is not as, um, quite intuitive way of, of measuring like how uh, big a matrix is, right? Like larger singular values will give you like larger uh, norm. And it turns out that most of these uh, settings for different P's are norms that are known elsewhere or have different names. So if you take P infinity, well, P infinity, you're taking the largest of these numbers, right? The L infinity norm of this vector, which is going to be as one by construction. So it gives you the, the, the norm as infinity is just the largest singular value, which happens to be the spectral norm or the operator norm or the induced L2 norm. These norms like uh, appears everywhere in different names. If you pick P equals 2, then P equals 2 is just going to be the L2 norm of this vector, right? It's going to be the square root of the sum of the singular value squared. And you can actually show that this is equal to that Frobenius norm over there. Uh, so this sum over like the squares of the entries is also the sum over like the squares of the singular values. And if p equals 1, which is kind of a very interesting norm, you get something that depending on, on the literature, it's called the nuclear or the trace norm. This is just the sum of the singular values, right? Because it's an L1, but all these guys are non negative. And what happens here is that this is very interesting because in, in, in some sense, the nuclear norm, like the, the Shatter norm with P equals one, is the best convex approximation of the rank function, right? So the rank function, if I give you a matrix and I ask what's the rank of this function, this is a non-convex function on, on the entries of the matrix. The, the, the Shatter norms, they are all convex and they are all convex in the entries of the matrix. And this one happens to be the best convex approximation, meaning that is the convex envelope of the rank. So that is interesting because, because we know that the complexity of a Hankel matrix in terms of the size of the automaton that we can recover from it is its rank, right? Like higher rank will give us more states and kind of it's intuitive that more states will give you a more complex hypothesis. Therefore, more potential for uh, overfitting. So, uh, we could try, for example, to say, well, what we want to do is like find a Hankel matrix that agrees with the data but minimizes the rank. But because the rank is non-convex, this is going to be like a hard problem. Instead, what we can do is, is try to come up with a convex approximation of the rank and put it in there, and that's going to be the nuclear norm. And that's like, well, it's a heuristic that can be justified theoretically in some cases that is used throughout, uh, say, machine learning and signal processing when you have to do things that like try to minimize a rank. Thank <laughs> you.
And in, in general, we can use these Shatten norms to control the complexity of, of Hankel matrices, uh, both infinite and, and finite. And we can use this to define hypothesis classes for learning with weighted automata. So again, like given a p uh, between 1 and infinity and an r bigger than 0, we can define a class of Hankel matrices, which is going to correspond to a class of functions from strings to real numbers, because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence there, uh, by taking uh, all the matrices, all the Hankel matrices that have Shatten p norm bounded by r. Uh, and when we use this hypothesis class for learning, uh, I mean, this is kind of a, like a theoretical construction, right? We'll never be learning with infinite uh, Hankel matrices, but if we could, uh, well, we would be getting like this uh, Rademacher complexity bounds for like uh, our like say generalization bounds, which again look uh, in in the case two it looks very similar to the one that we had for the language r over square root m, but obviously this r is is a different r, and uh, for the nuclear norm right we get again like something that is r we have an extra log term instead of square root m we get an m and then we have a new quantity that again depends on the distribution or, or the sample, depending on which Rademacher complexity you're using exactly. And uh, if, if you've like, been tracking these, these quantities that appeared, right? the first one was the expectation of the longest string, which is kind of pretty intuitive. The second one was kind of like about the expectation of like how many repetitions you will see in, in your data set. And this one, it, I mean, it gets a bit weird. It's just what comes up of the analysis. But it basically says that if you have a sample, you can like take each string and split it into a prefix and a suffix. And you want to do this in a way that minimizes the following. It minimizes the maximum between um, the number of times a prefix appears or the number of times a suffix appears. And again, that is related to the fact that when we like factorize this Hankel matrix, like we're looking at prefix and suffixes separately. And I mean, this, this, this quantity just appears. Um, I don't know, it's, it's, there's some intuition there, but it's just something that comes up in, from the analysis. Uh, but the good news is that, well, we can control the Rademacher complexity of learning with Hankel matrices just using the Schatten norm. And by using the, the, for example, the nuclear norm, we'll get something that will be kind of the best convex approximation to trying to minimize the rank, therefore trying to minimize the number of states in your automaton. So, yes, but so far these are all like statistical learning results. Uh, we need to turn these into algorithms somehow. And it's, it's not so straightforward. So the first you can do is, is uh, I mean, obviously, I had this, no, I had this Rademacher complexity bound if I control the, the PQ norm of the weights. So you could try to like minimize in there directly. As I said, this is a non-convex optimization problem, which is like minima, find an automaton with n states, or at most n states, that minimizes the empirical risk over the data and has a PQ norm bounded by R. You can actually try to solve this if your loss is differentiable using like stochastic projected gradient descent or, or projected gradient descent. And actually, people do this all the time these days with recurrent neural networks. It's not a bad algorithm. It's just that we don't know how to prove much about it. Um, so, so to get an idea of what you need to do here, if, you, if it was like five years ago, probably, you would have to go and compute these gradients manually, which means that, well, you have this loss uh, on a, a, x on some string and y, and you want to, for example, find the gradient with respect to the weights on the symbol a. So if your string is ABCA, you end up with these horrendous expressions, and you would have to do this by hand five years ago. The good thing is that these days we have this automatic differentiation that the people uh, that work on deep learning have worked like very hard to, to get um, going. And these are like basically like software tools that compute these gradients automatically. So right now I think this is feasible, and some people have actually used it in, in practice. Um, and, and you can like, well, you can justify this choice of regularizer using the Rademacher complexity bound, but I mean, this is, is, is as far as it gets. It might work very well empirically. You might have like underfitting because you, because you might get stuck in a local minima. 
at least if you use project, uh, projected gradient descent, if you introduce like stochastic gradient descent, which means at each time step, instead of you not know, each iteration of gradient descent, instead of looking at the whole of my data set, I just look at a subsample, like you can solve this problem with uh, local minima sometimes. Um, but it might work, it might not. Uh, or it might require like a lot of tuning of the, of the parameters of your gradient descent and so on. So it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's neat, but it doesn't have theoretical guarantees. So if you want theoretical guarantees for, for this type of uh, learning algorithms, where you just get a sample of like strings and real numbers, and you want a weighted automata that kind of agrees with those, you have to use the Hankel matrix, right? Because now this is a completely like convex optimization problem, right? It says, find me a Hankel matrix over some set of prefixes and suffixes that I've given you that agrees with the data with respect to this loss function that I also specified because it, it makes sense for my problem. And make it so, such that this matrix, uh, the, its uh, Schatten p norm is always upper bounded by R, and therefore I get good generalization when I take this H hat and convert it into an automaton using the algorithm that I showed you before. And this is kind of interesting because uh, in, in a sense what you're doing here is, is a matrix completion problem, right? So if I pick this set of prefixes and suffixes and I'm trying to learn a Hankel matrix here, and I have this data that tells me, for example, on A, I want you to predict one. So I look at the A and I put a one here and so on. So then I end up with this, this kind of Hankel matrix that has some like missing entries in it. So what, what you're doing here is essentially like some Hankel matrix completion problem. And, and, and well, we know how to analyze like statistically what you like the generalization power of what you get out of like solving this, which is a convex optimization problem for like this regularizer uh, using both the Radamacher complexity and, and like some previous analysis what was based on algorithmic stability. But the missing, the biggest missing ingredient here, in, in my opinion, and that's kind of one of the, of the open problems that, that I want to highlight in this lecture is that the way you would put this optimization problem into like say a standard uh, convex optimization toolkits is pretty naive, uh, pretty redundant and very, uh, is, is very far from efficient. So the, the, the missing bit to make these things like really, really practical and, and obviously like, like scale to large alphabets, right? That's, that's, that's the biggest constraint here, the size of the alphabet because the, if I add like like string say up to length t here, I get like a, like sigma to the t uh, rows, so this grows really fast, is really having algorithms that are like specialized for this type of optimization problem. So that's kind of the, the biggest uh, open thing here. We, we know how to solve them, like, uh, but it's, it's, although it's polynomial time, it's not very efficient in practice because it's not specialized to the structure of the problem. Okay, so now, I want to move beyond sequential data a little bit. But uh, any questions uh, before we do that? Okay, so it turns out that these tools that I've been giving you, these ideas of like, let's represent your data uh, using a Hankel matrix. Let's look for objects like weighted automata whose like, uh, whose algebra is very related to the properties of the Hankel matrix, so we can do this learning trick, and, and so on and so forth, you can extend these ideas beyond sequential data. Um, so in particular, you can use the same ideas to learn objects that or models that go from sequence to sequence, as opposed to sequence to number. And you can also do similar things for uh, other types of objects that are compositional, right? In the, in the way sequences are compositional, trees, for example, are also compositional, and even graphs, but I'm not gonna go there. So what happens, uh, when is sequence to sequence uh, important? It's important in a lot of natural language processing applications, right? So for example, if you're doing sequence tagging, where somebody gives you a sequence, uh, a sentence, sorry, and you want to do part of speech tagging, meaning that for each word I want to assign like it's, it's part of speech role in, in, a, in a sentence, so I want to know that this guy is a verb, this guy is a noun, and so on. Uh, so this is a sequence to sequence problem. And, and the particularity here is that the length is preserved, right? I want a label for each uh, input symbol. 
some other sequence to sequence problems, the, 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 sequence, uh, the length of the sequence might change. For example, if you're doing spelling, a spelling correction, like somebody wrote apple with one P, and your uh, sequence to sequence model, what it should output is like the, the correct spelling, apple with two Ps. So this is like a sequence to sequence modeling in natural language processing, but similar things happen in reinforcement learning, uh, probably you've seen like in, in Hado's lecture, uh, that when you have an agent that is operating or interacting with a Markov decision process or even a partially observable Markov decision process, the dynamics that go, that go on is that the uh, agent collects traces of the following form. So it takes actions, action one, action two, action three, and for each action it gets back, for example, a pair of observations and rewards, right? So this is again a sequence to sequence uh, model where, for example, you might be interested in learning, well, uh, I want a model that if I, I conjecture I'm going to do these actions, I want to know like what rewards I'm going to get. Or am I going to like observe these things because I'm trying to get to like that, I don't know, like that shop. So uh, am I going to observe the sign of that shop if you're a, a self-driving car and stuff like this. So it happens that the, for many of these applications, actually, you can turn this um, sequence to sequence modeling, you can split it into parts. You can split it into like learning and inference. And maybe inference is not the right word here, but what I mean basically is that you can like find function from strings to real numbers, like we've been doing all along. But now the strings uh, at each position have an input and an output symbol as opposed to just one symbol. Or you could have more complicated things that like take strings of different lengths, but I'm not, I'm not going to discuss this, this case too much. And then you can like learn something of this type from data, and afterwards when you want to like do sequence to sequence modeling, you say, well, these are my sigmas, for example, find me the, the symbols in delta that maximize this f, or that minimize this f, or I don't know, average overall possible output. So, or any type of this thing. So basically, using this observation, uh, I'm not saying that this second problem is very easy. It can be very hard in practice, but that's how usually like, you, you can split this, this problem, like at least theoretically, in, into two nice parts. Uh, if you assume that part, then basically you're back to learning something that is like from sequences to numbers, but now your alphabet is slightly more complicated. So that's how uh, you formalize this thing, you can exactly use the, the Hankel trick where now what you're trying to learn is like an input-output weighted finite automata and like honestly like uh, there's so many different names for this thing that I, I've given up on trying to find a standard so like people call weighted finite state transducers, predictive state representations when you're doing reinforcement learning, input-output observable operator models and like from, from some people in physics so yeah just uh, model of this type where now your transitions are indexed by a pair of symbols. And yeah, so, so this is the, the, the kind of uh, uh, things that you can learn. So when you're doing tagging, right, the semantics of this function that you're trying to learn can be like compatibility between like an input and an output. Or when you're doing dynamical, learning dynamical models, you can be, what's the probability that I observed like these uh, observations given that I take these, uh, these actions? Or you can even, like in reinforcement learning, instead of like the dynamics, you can be trying to model the rewards. If I do these, observation, these actions and I get these observations, what is my expected reward after this sequence? So everything that I showed you before, uh, with some little caveats here and there somewhere that I'm not going to get into, uh, applies where you just now use the Hankel trick with the Hankel matrix that is defined over like uh, pairs of sequences that have uh, input and outputs. And you can like check these references. I'll put the slides in, in my website afterwards, so you, or I think maybe in, in, the, in the summer school website. And you can check uh, like applications of these and more concrete algorithms of how you do this in practice because, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm just hand waving a little bit here. It's not straightforward, um, but, but can be done. So the other thing that I want to highlight is that similar ideas work when you're dealing with trees. And again, trees is something that appears quite often in natural language processing applications, um, where, for example, you want to model dependencies, right? So you might have dependencies inside the, sequ inside the sentence. Is that, uh, what, what is the name, what is the verb, what depends on what? Even inside the document, like how do, like, how is the document arranged? Like, is, like, well, this is the abstract, this part explains the introduction, so you can do, like basically tasks where you have a sequence as input. So Mary plays the guitar, for example, uh, 
and what you want as output is a tree, and the tree that explains the dependencies in this sequence. For example, here we say, well, here's the sentence, it has a noun phrase and a verb, and a verb phrase, the noun phrase is composed by just a noun, that is Mary, the verb phrase is composed by a verb, which is place, and a noun phrase that contains the determinant and a noun, the guitar. Okay? So, uh, here, I mean, it's, it's interesting because, like, the tasks that you might want to solve and the models that you might be dealing with and the type of data that you might be getting, it, like, there's a lot of diversity, right? So, but essentially what goes on is that these techniques based on Hankel matrices, you can use them to learn, like, weighted context-free languages uh, and, and stuff like this. So you could even think that you're not interested in the tree, you're just interested in the representational power that you get from the tree, in, like in, in the same way that you go from, rush, from regular languages to context-free languages, right? And yeah, so when, and when you get data here, you can get different types of data, like, so like in NLP applications, things can get really messy, so you might get like labeled trees, where you have nice annotated data like this, Sometimes, like, somebody just bothered to give you, like, the dependencies. So this is how the tree looks like. I'm not going to annotate this stuff because you can derive this stuff from a part of speech tagger, for example. Or sometimes you're doing, like, a totally unsupervised learning. So you only have the yields and you're trying to find, well, like, trees that explain the regularities in your data and the dependencies in a way that is kind of unsupervised. Um, so one model that works kind of like, it, it kind of, like, serves as an umbrella for all these methods uh, could be like weighted tree automata. So in weighted tree automata is kind of similar to what we've been doing so far, but instead of modeling a function from strings to real numbers, now you model a function from labeled trees to real numbers. And it works as follows. So you have a ranked alphabet, which means just an alphabet that is like decomposed into several sub-alphabets, each one with its own index. So you have like sigma zero, sigma one, they're disjoint and so they're disjoint. And you can have a weighted tree automaton with end states, which, I mean, formally it looks quite similar to what we've been using so far. So you have a set of initial weights alpha. You have a set of transition tensors. Nobody gets too scared. Uh, so a tensor is just a generalization of a matrix, right? So a matrix is a two-dimensional tensor. So if I arrange several matrix together, I can get this three-dimensional object. Um, Right, so right, so uh, you could have like a collection of matrices here, and a collection of matrices would give you a tensor of, of order three. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, right, so here you have tensors of different orders that will depend on the rank of your symbols, uh, symbols in the alphabet, and then you have final weights. But now instead of just one set of final weights, you have one set of final weights for each uh, symbol in 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 sigma zero. And this has like a similar expressive power or higher than weighted context-free grammars and latent variable weighted context-free grammars. Um, and, and here's what's going on really, right? So you have these sort of trees that I like think about the, the Mary plays the guitar tree where you have leaves, right? The leaves would be the things in sigma zero would be the, the, the symbols that have uh, rank or RET0, and they cannot be composed with anyone. They can just like hang at the end of the tree. And then you have symbols, for example, A here, that would have like, has two things. So um, this would be in, in sigma two, for example, right? It would have like two inputs. And C, for example, has only one input, so it would be in sigma one. That's the, that, that sigma I is, is the RET. And the good thing about these trees is that they can be composed, right? So I can cut anywhere and represent this as a concatenation of two trees, where, well, the, the part that hangs below is this part here that is kind of is a normal tree, and the part that hangs above uh, just has one copy of one special symbol where you can, like, pluck another tree, right? So usually people this call an inside-outside factorization. So this would be the inside of the tree. If I split in this uh, arc here, and this would be the outside of the tree. And the interesting thing is that in the same th way that when I was splitting sequences, the computation that the weighted automata did factorized across this, this, this splitting, 
The same thing happens with weighted tree automata. So I don't have too much time to tell you how the weighted tree automata like computes things because basically it like it takes the things in the leaves and aggregates them up by using like so C would have a matrix here, so you would multiply this vector by a by a matrix to get a new vector in this edge here, and you would get two vectors here and put them into a tensor to get a new vector and so on. So you need tensors because you sometimes need to take two vectors to get a new vector. Um, but basically, that's that's this kind of structure that factorizes. So if I have T that is an outside tree composed with an inside tree, the function that the automaton assigns on that tree is going to factorize as an inner product of something that depends on the outside tree and the inner tree. And then if I have this symbol sigma, so if I say that the inside is kind of like sigma, which would be, for example, an RT2 symbol applied to two trees, T1 and T2, so in this case, sigma would be B, and T1 would be C and B, and T2 would be A. So then I, I can like rephrase this beta Ti as something that depends on the beta of T1, the beta of T2, and the symbol that I have here in the middle. And this thing that I said that I'm not going to make too explicit, that you can take a tensor, and in this case is a, a rank three ten, a order three tensor, uh, that takes two vectors and produces a new vector. And one of the ways that it, you can see that is if you take this tensor, you take all those matrices there and put them one next to each other, as opposed to a stacked in a three-dimensional object, if you, do, if you do this thing that we call like flattening of the tensor, where you get a matrix that is, is kind of uh, is, uh, rectang rectangular, you can actually see this as a, this as a matrix vector product where now the vector is kind of the, the Kronecker product of these two. So this is just to say that uh, you can do everything that I've done so far uh, to learn weighted tree automata with a Hankel trick where now the Hankel matrix, uh, instead of having like prefixes and suffixes which were both strings in the rows and columns, in the rows is going to have uh, outside trees, so it's going to have like trees that have this special symbol where you can pluck a new tree, and in the columns you will have regular trees. So for example, uh, you can see that if I take, um, let's see, what is an example here? So for example, if I take this outside tree, A with empty slot, and I pluck an A into the empty slot, I get a minus one, and this is the same that if I take this empty slot and I plug this AA3 here, so that's why I get like a minus one as well. So this has the same kind of like redundancy structure and you can also like prove a, a version of the fleece Kronecker theorem for this type of Hankel matrices and, and weighted tree automata. And you can again do like spectral learning, uh, which was like uh, for this, using this type of representations first done by, uh, by Yi and uh, Denis. And then like many people in natural language processing have taken these ideas and made like very interesting algorithms that work with these ideas. Maybe they don't work exactly with this matrix, but, but these are the same ideas that are going on in there. Okay, so I'm very near the end. If you have questions, uh, well, I'll move into the conclusion. Yeah. Yeah, can you do something if your alphabet sigma is infinite? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. You can do some things, but it requires you to craft uh, by hand a representation, a finite dimensional representation of your symbols. What I mean by this is that if you have like a Hankel matrix on an infinite alphabet, you could always like uh, kind of multiply it on the left and on the right by some projections. And if, if you pick these projections right, this is going to preserve the rank. So if you can pick these projections in a way that says, I know that although I have infinite symbols, they're going to have these regularities that I know how to encode manually into these projections, you can still show that most of the theory goes through. But it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty ad hoc. It's a trick. Uh, if, if you encounter a situation like this, uh, like a concrete example, uh, like you can look and, and actually like, like this idea like is, is present in there somehow. Like they don't have infinite alphabets, 
but they, because this, this matrix can go, can be really huge, they work with projections of it that preserve this rank property. And the projections are derived from things that you know about language. So these guys are people who like look at like, are really NLP people and they know a lot about language and they know how to derive these projections for a case where the matrix is not infinite, but, for, but you will get like English words in your rows and columns. So this can grow huge. But then, I mean, like, no, for the theory to go through, you have to say, assume that my projection satisfy this and that. And yeah, then things kind of work. Okay, so I didn't show any experiments, but yeah, it works too. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, over the years, like most of the papers that, that we've done and worked on, on this, for example, are, are published in machine learning conferences. And there we usually like have a, have uh, applications in mind. So we've compared the complexity of like different implementations and different algorithms. We have shown how you can apply these things, for example, to, to problems in reinforcement learning to learn about, for example, timing, uh, things about uh, uh, sequence to sequence modeling in, in different models, things about language modeling and, and so on. So there's, there's, there's uh, the references that I gave along the way, most of them like, like, con like uh, these papers, these plots come from those papers. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is a, a really rich area and there was no time to cover applications, but I just wanted to show that, uh, that in addition to pretty nice theorems, uh, you, you can like get so no, I don't know, I don't think the plots are as nice as the theorems, but uh, it works. Open problems, there's plenty of open problems. Uh, that, so I just wanted to highlight a few. So one of, of the most important open problems here when you want to do this in practice is how you pick PNS, right? It's PNS that define like your, your Hankel matrix. This is a parameter of your algorithm. We, how, we know how to prove results under like someone would say mild assumptions on what this PNS do. But selecting those from data and doing this optimally in a sense that you minimize the size of PNS because the bigger they are, the more running time you have. So ideally, you want to like spend less time computing. But also, the, the smaller they are, the, the more things about the data that they ignore. So you want to make them big. So what is, where is the trade-off and how you do this like from data is, is kind of one of the biggest open problems here. The other one that I also pointed out at some point is how we do like scalable convex optimization over Hankel matrix for solving this uh, matrix completion problem. Uh, other things that we don't know how to do that might be hard, but might like be amenable to like theoretical analysis in some con concrete cases, is how do we like constrain things about the output of the weighted automaton? So, for example, if we are learning a distribution, uh, maybe as output we want a probabilistic automata, right? But we cannot guarantee this with the spectral methods because there's this Q that gives you the rotation that we can control. So maybe the data was coming from a probabilistic automaton, but what I'm learning is this probabilistic automaton up to some Q and the, the numbers in there are negative and they don't look like probabilities anymore. Uh, can we do something there that, for example, will go back or like will constrain the output to be a probabilistic automaton? Because in that case, for example, we can do more, uh, no, the, at least probabilistic models are more interpretable and then you can do more interesting things in terms of like putting the outputs as initialization for other types of uh, machine learning algorithms like vision learning and so on. Um, there's something I didn't talk uh, at all about, which is that actually learning and some problem that we've been studying lately, which is approximate minimization, are kind of very interrelated, right? Approximate minimization as a problem, uh, so we know that if you give me a non-minimal weighted automaton, there's algorithms that minimize this thing, that give you the smallest uh, automaton that you can, that can represent the language. But you might try to go be below that. You can say, well, no, like the minimal has a thousand examples. That's still too big for me. I want something with 500 examples. So you can pose this as something that is called approximate minimization, right? Minimization beyond the, the minimal. And, and in a sense, what happens when you're doing learning with Hankel matrices is that you're putting your data in the Hankel matrix, at least when you're doing distributions. And that is kind of a representation of an automaton that completely mimics your data, right? It's, it's, it's minimal, but it completely overfits. So you can think that the algorithm that learns the automaton by taking an SBD decomposition and, and doing all this linear algebra is actually doing some approximate minimization of the automaton that completely uh, like mimics your data and doesn't generalize at all. 
So I think there's very nice connections there that are still uh, to be explored. And we have, a, we have a couple of papers on this, which uh, you can find. I don't think they're on the reference. You can find them on, on my website. Um, well, one thing that, I mean, like I get this question all the time, so I'm just like being preemptive here. How much of this could be extended over semi-rings? I don't know. To be honest, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure we can deal with uh, complex, like all this machinery would work with complex numbers, although I haven't seen any learning application that requires complex numbers. Uh, other fields, some of the stuff that, that we do here works with uh, other fields uh, with some like quotes in it, like uh, I don't know, finite fields and so on. Like you can, you don't have SBD, but you have these reconstruction algorithms for weighted automata and so on. Beyond that, like arbitrary semi rings, I have no idea. But uh, some of my colleagues in NLP have good intuitions for why, in some applications, you might want to use uh, semi rings. Well, some particular semi-rings, semi, I think like max plus semi-rings instead of uh, some plus semi-rings to model some natural language phenomena. So like that, that is like uh, very much an open problem, but it would have applications, uh, interesting applications if somebody like knew how to do this. And yeah, so as I said, like in some cases, you want to take the output of this spectral algorithm and put it into some as an initialization point of some other non-convex gradient-based algorithm uh, because that improves your accuracy. It can give you an extra boost in accuracy because you kind of squeeze your data a little bit more. And I mean, it seems like perfectly plausible and very like uh, reasonable to do. Uh, like in practice works, uh, it's amazing it, like how much you can improve with this. But we have no theory uh, about this. Uh, well, because like doing theory about this would be like doing theory about non-convex optimization. Although, in like non-convex optimization where you have a good initializer, but you would need to prove that it is a good initializer. So, like doing theory around this, I think would be really interesting. But yeah, I don't know how to do it either. So, uh, take home points. Basically, all I've shown you is based on a single building block. You use SBD of Hankel matrices to learn weighted automata, like different variants of weighted automata, different variants of how you estimate the Hankel matrix. It's amazing that how much you can do with a single building block. In addition, this single building block only requires some linear algebra. And well, like representing this Hankel matrix in memory that sometimes is like the biggest bottleneck because it can grow very big if your PNS is very big. Um, well, to get into this area, all you need to know is a little bit of linear algebra, a little bit of probability, a little bit of convex optimization, and a lot of lots of patience. So it's, it's, it's not that far-fetched. And well, you can get like pretty cool uh, practical applications for a variety of models and applications. Obviously, this was done like over a few years, and now if all you care about, I, I guess, is like uh, just accuracy on some data set, you'll probably do deep learning. Um, but if you care about using something that has like provable guarantees or your domain is one where like uh, deep learning doesn't apply because, I don't know, uh, say, say you want to do like, so I, I didn't talk too much about exact learning, but these things can also do exact learning because I think Ben was supposed to cover Angloin's algorithm, which is a version of this that does exact learning, but you don't have time to do it, but anyway. Uh, so in, 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 like, I don't know, it, it has some applications and, and, and the, the theory is really interesting. If you want to know a little bit more, uh, we have a tutorial that was recorded as well. And in this tutorial, uh, you can find more things about the tree stuff. So I think there's almost an hour about trees. So if you're interested in the tree stuff, there's a couple of survey papers I want to highlight. One was the Mary Armori and this one by uh, Thon and Jaeger. Um, this one tells you a little bit more about the history of these algorithms and different versions about like with, with queries and so on, as opposed to only the, the spectral bit. And this one is very nice because it, it, it gives like a survey of all these like weighted automata. And remember at some point I said, oh, and this like can also be seen as pro, uh, predictive theory representations, observable operator models, and so on. So this kind of tidies uh, like cleans house a little bit and tidies like all these connections and explains all these models into a single paper. So if you want to dive deep into this literature further, it's good to look at, at here because it will tell you like keywords for looking at other parts of the literature that don't con don't call these models automata, call them other things. There's a very nice uh, Python implementation of this spectral learning algorithm by people in Marseille. So if you're interested in like running this in, in practice, just check it out. 
And yeah, this is the thing that I just mentioned. So like neighboring literature, predictive physics representation, observable operator models uh, by people in reinforcement learning and people in physics, uh, they're also like starting points to dig further into this. And finally, I just want to say thanks to all the people who have collaborated in this research in one way or another. Uh, all very nice people. Thank you.